So up next, we have Brittany Crocker. She's from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and her field of study is computational neuroscience. Her advisor is Sydney Cash, and she did her practicum at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Good morning. Uh, I study the effects of electrical stimulation on the human brain. And the motivation for my work comes from the advent of implantable neurostimulation devices, often called brain pacemakers. Uh, these are devices that are implanted under the skin that have wires that go actually to electrodes implanted in the brain, and they deliver electrical signals with the goal of relieving symptoms from various neurological and psychiatric disorders. Um, and this technology has actually had great success in helping essential tremor and Parkinson's disease patients who suffer from these disorders. And there's been a huge interest in applying this technology to other disorders, things like OCD, epilepsy, addiction. Um, and there's been a huge concerted effort over the past decade or two to attempt to apply this method to other, to extend the method to other diseases. But largely these efforts have failed or progress has been very slow. And you can start to get a reason, an understanding of the reason why when you look at how we discovered effective stimulation parameters for Parkinson's disease. So this is an example of a paper where in order to figure out which stimulation frequency to use, uh, they literally tried all of them. And then they figured out that high frequency stimulation is effective for reducing tremor. And so that's what they use. But even today in patients who have these uh, devices implanted, they still have to go through a, tr a smaller trial and error process individually with their doctor to achieve appropriate uh, therapeutic results. Trial and error methods are a large bottleneck in a highly dimensional space. When you're applying these methods, uh, you have to think about where to implant the electrode, what stimulation frequency to use, what amplitude to use, a lot of other parameters that go into the stimulation pulse itself. Uh, and this is a huge bottleneck because it's just a very large, highly dimensional parameter space that takes a long time to explore for every individual disease. So what you would like to do is apply some kind of principled approach. And to do that, you need to understand what the mechanisms of brain stimulation are. Um, currently, <clears throat> there are people who have looked at, from a very analytical physics level, um, how stimulation affects the brain. And I mean, when you give a pulse of electricity to the brain, you induce an electric field. These electric fields cause uh, voltage-gated ion channels on the surface of the membrane of neural, neural axons to open and close. And this electric field depends very much on the polarity of the electrode and the geometry of how the electrode is relative to the axon of the neuron. And so there have been uh, stimulation simulations uh, where people have looked at the geometry of the axons and the polarity of the electrode stimulation and they've shown for example that different polarities of stimulation because of the geometry of different populations of neurons actually activate different populations of neurons and so how does this stimulation simulation play out in experimental results well, here's an example of a paper where they used clinically relevant stimulation parameters, and they recorded from a single neuron, and you can see like before stimulation, it's firing, and then when you stimulate, the firing rate increases, and then when you stop stimulating, it goes back to normal. Here's another neuron, and this neuron did the exact opposite. So if you look at the activity of a population of neurons, some of them increase their firing rate, some of them decrease their firing rate, some of them don't change at all. And this becomes very difficult to apply this kind of very fine-grained understanding of the mechanisms of stimulation um, to yield clinically relevant therapeutic parameters. So trial and error methods are slow. Um, current stimulation research um, has not produced clinically relevant results in terms of understanding. So we need, to underst we need a principled way of understanding brain stimulation that will still be clinically relevant. So what I do is I look at the effects of brain stimulation on brain waves. We've been recording brain waves since the 1920s. These are, um, can be recorded both inside and outside the brain. And different 
so if you look at the power spectrum of these brain waves in different frequency bands, um, the power of those frequency bands will correlate with different types of behaviors and also can be markers of disease. Um, in neuroscience, we name, these, we name these frequency bands by Greek letters, so beta is around 20 hertz. And when it's, the power of beta is inversely correlated with movement. So when you move, beta decreases. And Parkinson's patients, who, which have trouble moving, actually have abnormally high levels of beta in their motor cortex. So we can use these brain stimulations as a proxy for understanding how brain stimulation works. I work in a lab um, where we deal with patients who have intractable epilepsy. That's epilepsy that's so bad that pharmaceutical methods have so far not yielded any good results. And these patients are actually going to the hospital to get some of their brain removed. Before that happens, they get electrodes implanted in their brain. This is an example of a patient who had a grid of electrodes implanted in the, his frontal lobe um, and some strips. And these electrodes are clinically determined um, and implanted for clinical reasons in order to figure out where the seizures are coming from. Um, a typical patient will get about 100 electrodes. These electrodes are very large. They just record large aggregate signals. Um, and in our case, this, we would record continuously for about two weeks at 2,000 hertz. And we would get probably about half a gigabyte of data per patient. Typically speaking, we can analyze the recordings from each of these uh, electrodes independently, so it's embarrassingly parallel in that way, and we would use very standard dense linear algebra techniques and FFTs. So this is not quite rising to the level of something that requires high performance computing. But uh, as we move forward, we're also implanting, in addition to clinical electrodes, research electrodes. So this is an example of a research electrode that is about a square centimeter. It has a hundred recording needle electrodes on its surface, and um, it can record both single neurons and brain waves at the same time. Um, these electrodes, in order to capture the fast dynamics of individually spiking neurons, have to be recorded at a much higher sampling rate. That means for an individual patient, we will get about five terabytes of data just for one person. And at this level, things even like matrix multiplication starts to become very challenging. Um, so this is just to give you an example of the kinds of signals that I record in the human brain. Um, here you'll see at two seconds uh, a very large <coughs> artifact. That's the stimulation pulse itself. So these electrodes record the stimulation pulse. And then afterwards, you'll see this deviation from baseline that's very large. It's called an evoked potential this little bump here. And there have been people who have studied stimulation-induced evoked potentials. Um, and with this method, we can sort of evaluate what are some of the assumptions more systematically that people have made about these evoked potentials and how well do they actually pan out. So one example is if we have an, a stereotypical evoked potential here, there are two peaks, N1 and N2. And you'll see a lot in the literature people say that um, N2 is a much more variable, less reliable part of the signal. And in the time domain, that does pan out. So you can see that here there's a very wide variation in the amplitude of the N2 response. And sometimes you can't see it at all. But if you look at the um, power in the spectrum between, say, 1 and 20 hertz, what you see is that even at those time ranges, there's it's pretty easy to pick out that there's still some kind of response to the brain. So um, the reason why that is, why it's easy to see this in the power domain and not the time domain, if you look here, is that the phase coherence drops off pretty quickly over cross trials. So individual trials um, might not have a very consistent phase um, of the time pull, of the like time domain signal, but the power is still there. Um, and what this so what this shows is that actually the even in response to a single pulse of stimulation, which is less than a millisecond long, you have measurable results 300 milliseconds later, which is something surprising. Similarly, 
people, okay, there we go, refer to the N2 pulse in a, when they talk about the dose response of N2, they say that it's an all or nothing response. So either you get it or you don't, and there's no in between. And we were actually able to show that that's not true. That in, uh, at low stimulation amplitudes, if you try a lot of different amplitudes, that there's actually a linear relationship between the dose response. And characterizing things like the dose response of stimulation and also how long a single stimulation pulse lasts is sort of the necessary first step towards developing larger models about how stimulation works. Finally, one thing, one assumption people make, which I think actually no neuroscientists actually believe, is that the evoked potential is something static. So if you measure the evoked potential over time, that it should be relatively constant. Um, and that's probably not true. I mean, we know that there are fluctuations in the amplitude of the evoked potential over time. And if you look at the power immediately before stimulation and the phase of the signal immediately before stimulation in that same, uh, in, the, in the different frequency bands, um, what you actually see is actually the, these scales are not the same, so this is not the best graph, but in the power, you don't see much of a relationship at all, nothing significant. But in the phase, in the same 10, 20 hertz range, it actually makes a big difference. So, depending on which phase of the cycle, where, you, where that stimulation pulse actually lands, you get a modulation of the effects of stimulation, um, which will be helpful when you want to develop something like closed loop stimulation, for example. Um, so that's uh, the results that I have so far. I wanted to take a moment to just thank uh, Krell and CSGF for amazing opportunities that I've had with this fellowship. Uh, had a wonderful time in Los Alamos. For those of you who are looking for practicum locations, highly recommend it. Uh, I uh, went to Argonne in the Argonne Exascale Computing Training uh, and uh, also just got in touch with a bunch of fabulous fellows, many of whom have answered my emails about how to do certain things uh, in, on these big machines and have been very helpful. Um, I would not have been able to do this alone. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs>